That's it! I've come up with a new type of emotional trauma. Hi, hello everybody. So I just finished playing Episode Ignis. Now, Episode Ignis is the third story DLC for Final Fantasy XV. Before that, we had Episode Gladio, then Episode Prompto, and now Ignis. And this DLC is Square Enix's big send-off for all the new stuff out of the 15 over the last year, and what a send-off it was. Now, before we jump into the nitty-gritty details and overview of the DLC, if you have not already, I highly recommend you go watch my reviews on Gladio's and Prompto's DLC. So you know where I'm coming from standard-wise, and also to watch my other videos because someone has to. Pressure's on, boys. Now, on top of Ignis's DLC, I will be talking about some of the new free updates that have come out alongside this DLC because they are some pretty neato stuff, but I'm not going to be covering everything. Final Fantasy 15 has had some pretty hefty and minor updates and changes in the last years, and I've skipped over them mainly because it's hard to keep up with all of them, and also mainly because some of them are not worth mentioning. And yes, if anyone's curious, I did play the Assassin's Creed free update, and I wasn't impressed since it was a hack job mess of an experience. There you go, there's your review on it. Boom. But this video is mostly gonna be focused on the things that really matter. And before y'all nervous Nelly shove your head into the sand and fear I'm a spoil stuff, do not panic, do not worry. I will be talking about stuff in a spoiler-free manner, and I will be warning y'all before I drop those big story deeds, because Lord knows we need to talk about some stuff in this thing. And also, if you haven't already, please play Final Fantasy 15 first before watching this, because I'm gonna be spoiling the main game plot, because I, I kinda have to, so, so yeah. Yeah. But anyway, enough about that crap, let's jump into episode Iggy Azalea. So I like to start these types of videos off by getting the big question out of the way. Is episode Ignis good? Yes, it's a great story DLC that I highly recommend if you enjoyed Final Fantasy XV or episode Prompto. This has been a DLC that many people, including myself, have been looking forward to since it's supposed to elaborate on and answer many of the questions in the Final Fantasy XV story, along with giving more depth to Ignis as a character, and it does deliver on those expectations. Now, Square Enix has built up Episode Ignis as the biggest story DLC out of the three, and I wouldn't say it blows Episode Prompto out of the water when it comes to the amount of content. To my surprise, Episode Ignis is around the same size, if not slightly shorter, than Episode Prompto. But that's not to say Episode Ignis is lacking in content or feel short, but it's just a just-so-you-know thing since Square was making Ignis out to be the biggest and longest DLC. Now, to be fair, when it comes to just story content, as from going from point A to B and making your way through the game casually, yeah, it's about two hours or so, but you can stretch out the gameplay since the first part of the DLC has some extra fight, side content, and just stuff to check out. You really can take your time in the first half, how about that? Now, what has been nice about the main cast episodes is how unique each DLC feels from one another, although I can confidently say that episode Gladio is definitely the weakest out of the three, but episode Prompto and Ignis have the same level of quality, but different types of variety. Ignis's DLC has its own good unique aspects, while still maintaining a satisfying, dense experience. It's got special combat, areas to explore and take over, action set pieces, and good story exposition, so it's an overall bang in time. Now, once again, the DLC does add much, much more to 15 to make it feel more whole, and I understand the frustration of feeling the need to dish out more money on side content to get the full product, and 15 is no exception to this. You should criticize 15 for basically putting up a paywall for important story details that are not explained in the main game, and I really don't want to praise Square Enix for the hack patch job of 15. It's it's not <laughs> it's been a bumpy ride, y'all. However, assuming that you get 15 now and find the base game for around $20 or so, which is pretty easy. I've seen a bunch of people do it. Either with the $25 season pass or just paying $5 to $10 for Ignis and Prompto's DLC, not Gladio's as much as that pains me to say that. Along with the plethora of free updates that adds a ton to the base game, it's not a terrible deal now. Not defending it, keep that in mind. I'm definitely not happy with how this has been handled, but this DLC is worth the money assuming you get the base game cheap, and I mean cheap. Now, by itself, Episode Ignis is really neck and neck with Promptos for being my favorite DLC out of the bunch, and I feel like everything that needed to be in it was in it, and even more stuff than I was not expecting story-wise, which I'll get into near the end, mind you. But overall, Episode Ignis is very good. Bun seal of approval, yay! They didn't ruin Ignis's character, oh my gosh, Square Enix actually did something semi-good again. Oh man, man, the <laughs> it's a fun time being a Square Enix fan. Fan, air quote. Uh, but yes, very, very, very good. But honestly, who cares if you should play this thing? Most of you all watching are already 
on the boy band pain train straight to hell and want to know about them deets. So let's talk about Tall, Pale, and Sharp over here and how Ignis plays. So what's been cool about each character's DLC is how Square has handled their gameplay. Each character has a unique type of gameplay style, from brute force and takes damage and hits hard with Gladio, to sharpshooting gunplay and explosions prompto, and now fast moves big magic and dagger action with Ignis. Now Ignis gameplay is very similar to Nox, but with its own twist. Since Ignis thing is using magic and daggers, you get the choice of three magic types, Blizzard, Fire, and Thunder, that change up your attack pattern and you can switch to your element on the fly. Alongside that, once again, you get special attacks that you can activate after your green bar of death fills up, and these things unleash a lot of damage and yada yada yada. This is stuff we've all seen before. Again, Ignis controls pretty similar to Noct, although I'd say Ignis controls better than Noctis and just feels better to play since Iggy is just way more fast and snappy. I always felt like Noctis isn't as reactionary as he could be, and Ignis really highlights this since he feels way more fluid in his animations and attack patterns. This may have something to do with the fact that Square had more time to work out the combat kinks to make Iggy feel more fun to play, but honestly, who knows? It also doesn't help Nox's case in the fact that you get a slingshot-like thing in the first part of the DLC that works identical to Nox's warp ability. I actually think it's the same exact mechanic and programming, it's just animated differently, but Ignis feels like a massive badass with a slingshot on top of being able to take out waves of enemies and tanks with ease. Basically, Nox better step his game up because Ignis is killing it out there, oh my god. <laughs> Those buns doing work. Overall though, Ignis's combat is simple but effective and fun. But one massive issue with the combat is that the ice blades are hella busted. I'm not sure if Square balanced the combat out that much because I barely use the fire and thunder blades because the blizzard ones will just rip through anything. It's outrageous. I cut through waves of dudes with ease just spamming ice blades the whole time and oh my lord, this boy can take out the whole freaking armada with these things, good god. High key, I only ended up actually using the other blade types because I felt bad for them and then the thunder one can close distance slightly faster and that's kind of it. I mean, I played the DLC on standard mode and considering how OP the ice blades are, it's actually too easy. Uh, so that's something Square might want to look into. Either that or just zhuzh up the fire and thunder blades to give them a chance against the ice blades because it's, it's a little outrageous. It's a good thing Ignis gets his eyes nerfed after the DLC because this boy could take out everybody, including me. Now, the combat is definitely at its best when you're fighting groups of enemies, which is most of the DLC, but sadly, Ignis does not escape the crap boss syndrome that 15 has been plagued with. This is something I haven't talked about in my reviews of 15, and I feel like I should have at some point since it's a pretty obvious issue, but heck, I'm doing it now. Better late than never. Most, if not all, the boss fights in the base 15 game are not fun to fight. Don't get me wrong, they have a really cool and big spectacle factor going on, but when it comes down to a standard 1v1 boss fight, the combat just does not make it fun and interesting. Many of the boss fights have a massive health pool, and because the combat is geared towards dealing with a ton of enemies, when it's just one dude, the fighting becomes pretty repetitive and tedious, and Episode Ignis does not break this mold at all. There is a handful of 1v1 fights, and even though Ignis's combat feels more fluid than Nox, it's just a rinse and repeat slog fest. Not to say that the bosses are bad, they're cool on a surface level, you're not gonna want to punch your TV out of anger or something, but they're just really boring after a while. They just take too long. But then again, who the heck cares about gameplay? Sounds like stupid gamer talk, am I right, guys? This is a story DLC, after all. That's the goodness we're all after. And like I said before, Episode Ignis delivers on the story expectations. The DLC takes place during the attack on Alticia around Chapter 9 after Noct takes out the Leviathan, and we find out how Ignis went blind. But through your journey to help out Noctis, we get more exposition on Ignis's character and how important Noct is to him, and we get more action with Ravis, and his motivations, along with more information about the Star Scourge and the Ring of the Luciai. Now, just talking bare basic story here, it's emotional and satisfying, especially for Ignis, and it makes you understand and feel for the characters more, and it fits into the main story very, very well. And also screaming. Lots and lots and lots and lots of screaming. Just, like, a lot of it. Now, the DLC does some really weird story stuff that adds a lot more to the plot, but in a way that I was not expecting, and I'm not really sure it was the best place to put exposition. Just know that if you want all those tasty 15 deets, you really really should play the extra verses after beating the DLC so you get the full picture and I'm not playing around with this guys you really should play this now this is where I'm gonna be jumping into spoilers guys so get out of here now if you want to see all this stuff for yourself or just jump to this point in the video so you don't get spoiled all right okay let's dissect this mess in three two one okay so you know bare basics out of the way we find out that Ignis goes blind because he used the ring of the Lucii to fight Arden to save Noct the ring only likes Noct and will borderline kill and reject everyone else because they ain't got that royal blood 
but Lucia's glaives, aka Ignis, can use the ring for a little while as long as they sacrifice something, either it be their life or their big toe, or in this case, Ignis sacrificed his eyes, okay, okay? Nothing new, we already know this, a lot of this crap was explained in King's Glaive, moving on. But what episode Ignis does that was really out of left field for me is having a really elaborate non-canon ending in the extra verses, not just for the DLC story, but the whole freaking main game. Now, I am fully aware that there are technically multiple endings to this DLC, but I really just want to focus on the main, main alternative ending. The one with the most weight, the one that really matters, if you will. And in this ending, if you decide to give in to Arden, he takes you to the base in Chapter 13, where the crystal is being held, and you get exposition on both Arden's origins and the Star Scourge origins, aka the Eternal Night Darkness Noctis has to banish. Now, this is stuff that is not explained well at all in the main game, and I already knew about this stuff because I've researched a lot of 15. I knew about Arden's origins being a rejected King of the Lucii and stuff back in the day, but the fact that this game decided to put, in my opinion, really crucial canon information in a non-canon ending is just bizarre. This once again adds to the whole Final Fantasy XV story is painfully disjointed problem. Now, I can't complain about the exposition in general. It was fine. I, I actually kind of liked how it was done, but I can totally complain about its placement. Now, after all that stuff goes on, you still fight Arden in the base using the Ring of the Lucii, and because of that, it creates a different ending to 15 altogether, where Ignis doesn't go blind somehow through Nox's sensual touch or whatever. And at the end of the main story, you get to see Ignis greet Noctis on the throne as if he didn't die. They call this ending Possibilities, and it's a really happy ending for Ignis, and it's very emotional, and I may have almost teared up and stuff, and ooh, but notice how I said Ignis sees him as if he didn't die, because if we are taking this ending at face value, it seems that Noctis doesn't die at all, but that really can't be the case, unless the game pulled some massive deus ex machina out of its butt that is never shown or explained ever. You see, 15 story is kind of hard to follow near the end, because it doesn't explain what the Scar Surge really is, but fun fact, y'all, Arden may be the bad guy, but killing him does not end the Star Scourge. Noctis has to sacrifice his life to bring light back into the world, because he's the only one who can summon the old kings and do so. They ain't doing that crap for free, y'all. Someone's gotta pay up. So even though Ignis stopped Arden early, Noctis still has to sacrifice himself in order to stop the Endless Night and Darkness, which is obviously still happening because we see it in the cutscenes. Now, people have speculated that Noct does still die in this alternative ending, but because Ignis can still see because of the hoodoo voodoo magic crap or whatever, the Noct that he is seeing is just an illusion or dream. I mean, there is no sound in the final scene, which makes it kind of sketchy, so take that as you will. And I'm sorry to burst y'all's happy bubbles, but unless Square just rewrote how the story is supposed to work out of left field, Noctis is supposed to die either way. Arden being defeated before or after Chapter 13 does not make a difference. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Ravus does end up living in this alternative ending, but that makes sense since Ignis was fighting Arden during what was supposed to be Chapter 13. So Chapter 13 never really happened, ergo Ravus never died. Uh, so him living makes sense. No one fight me on that, alright? That's not that's like a plot hole or anything. Thing. Also, fun fact, episode Prompto would have never happened in this alternative ending as well because there was no train crap scene because, you know, Arden was busy getting slapped with icicles by the dude on fire. I don't know, just something I noticed. It's amazing what one decision can make. The more you know. Now, to be fair, I can't nitpick or get angry at this ending because, again, non-canon. I'll admit it was neat seeing how things could have played out. So I give this alternative stuff a good B- minus for creativity and overall effectiveness. It was emotional. It was good, you know. I felt something, that's nice. So that wraps up my feelings on that emotional roller coaster of screaming. Moving on though. So Square once again added free updates alongside more DLC. And in this big patch, they finally added the ability to switch and play as other characters in combat. Now I've been waiting on this for a while now, since in Final Fantasy Versus 13, switching characters was supposed to be a core part of the gameplay. And it's nice that they're going back to the original vision of just a little bit, but not as in depth if you know what I mean. Now, at first I thought Square was gonna go for a four player co-op thing, cause that would be cool and fun as hell, playing as all the characters and whatnot with a group of four people. Amazing! And I'm still holding out for that, but comrades ended up happening instead, so yeah. We get this, but hey, it's not bad. Now that each character's gameplay has been solidified by their DLCs, you can switch to them on the fly, and yeah, go figure, it's the same exact combat from their DLC. Now at first, I was very confused as to how to even get the switching to work. I was messing around with buttons for like a solid 20-30 minutes, looked up stuff, couldn't find anything, took forever. But just a big FYI for everybody, this is kind of important. 
In order to get access to play as each character, you need to unlock the ability in your Ascensions menu under the Techniques tab. Now, each character is about 20 AP each, and hilariously, I ran out of AP to unlock Gladi on the footage I got, and oh, what a sad day. He is just not getting any love. I'm sorry, my precious boy. So if anyone else is confused, it's in the Techniques tab. Just go ahead and check it out. Pay up, all right? Then you can play as the characters. It's pretty far on the skill tree, so it's not particularly designed for you to get access to if you're starting a brand new spanking game. You gotta work for it. The point is, I eventually got it working, and it's just how you think it would be. It's really nice to finally shake up the gameplay, and each character is definitely more useful against certain enemies than others. Ignis may be OP as crap still, but flying monsters are no longer annoying as hell, because Prompto can take them out with ease, so that's nice. The one issue I will say is that the switching is not as fast as it could be. It takes a few seconds for the game to switch controls and characters, so that could really use some work to make it more fluid and fun. I don't like just, you know, standing out there while being attacked by a giant crab. It's weird. It's like the game has to, like, think about it for a second. Honestly, tempted me to buy a PS4 Pro, but uh, I digress. Hopefully, it will be improved over time, is what I'm trying to say. In fact, you could say that for most of Final Fantasy XV, since Square does plan to add another year's worth of content, and it just proves my point when I say that Final Fantasy XV will be an amazing game in 2019. Oh, God, this is such an interesting type of game to discuss. Now, I could scream a lot more about XV as per usual, but I'ma save some thoughts for a year in review video for 15 that I plan to do once more of these updates and DLCs come out. So we're gonna end it here before I write another like 5,000 words about this freaking game that has just consumed my life and stuff. You know, ironically, I still really like playing the base game. Getting footage of this took me back. Mm, I think I'm gonna jump into it soon again. Mm, man, I am a sheeple. Oh my god. Other than that though, guys, if you have played episode Ignis, please tell me what you think. And if you played the other DLCs, tell me how they compare and what you, what's your favorite DLC out of the bunch and uh, what's your favorite recipe if you know what I mean all right cool neo neato guys we are ending it here get the heck out uh, like favorite subscribe actually yeah hit that like button you know what I'm tired yeah I'm gonna be petty for a second hit that mick freaking like button down below I normally don't ask for likes in fear of being obnoxious but you know what people are gonna say my voice is obnoxious either way so you know what hit that mick freaking like button follow that subscribe button like favorite and subscribe please hit the freaking like button I, this is a social experiment if you don't you failed. Sorry, guys. Okay, get out of here. Toodles.